Let's open the Bibles up to Matthew chapter 25. And we'll start with verse 14. And we'll read uh, a couple of verses. Matthew 25. Starting with verse 14. Tonight I'd like us to look uh, towards one of Jesus' stories, one of his parables. The third from a series that Jesus uh, addresses on, on, uh, upon the mountain when the disciples ask him, when, when will you come back, Lord? Jesus uh, promises that he will come back and the disciples are very interested when, when Jesus will decide to come back. And Jesus starts by telling them a series of parables. And the third is the parable of the bags of gold. I won't uh, go into much detail about the, the previous parables, but I'll give you a few ideas from, from each. And you at home can go analyze them on themselves because all these uh, parables in Matthew 25 are connected with, um, with one another. So, Matthew 25, starting with verse 14. Again, it will be like a man going on a journey who called his servants and entrusted his wealth to them. To one he gave five bags of gold, to another two bags, and to another one bag, each according to, their, to his ability. Then he went on his journey. The man who had received five bags of gold went at once and put his money to work and gained five bags more. So also, one with two bags. So also, the one with two bags of gold gained two more. But the man who had who had received one bag went off, dug a hole in the ground, and hid his master's money. After a long time, the master of those servants returned and settled accounts with them. The man who had received five bags of gold brought, brought the other five. Master, he said, you entrusted me with five bags of gold. See, I have gained five more. His master replied. Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful with few things. I'll put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's happiness. The man with two bags of gold also came. Master, he said, you entrusted me with two bags of gold. See, I have gained two more. His master replied, Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful with few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's happiness. Then the man who had only received one bag of gold came. Master, he said, I knew that you were a hard man, harvesting where you have harvesting where you have not sown and gathering where you have not scattered seed. So I was afraid and went and so I was afraid and went out and hid your gold in the ground. See, here is what belongs to you. His master replied, You wicked, lazy servants. You knew that I harvested where I have not sown and gathered where I have not scattered seed. Well then, you should have put my money on deposit with the bankers so that when I returned, I would have received it back with interest. So take the bag of gold from him and give it to the one who has ten bags. For whoever has will be given more and then will have, will have an abundance. Whoever does not have even what they, whoever does not have even what they will, even what they have will be taken from them, and throw that worthless servant outside into the darkness where there will be the weeping and gnashing of teeth. You can sit back down now. As uh, I mentioned before, this parable, the third in the in number, comes from a series of parables that Jesus uh, tells the disciples as um, answer to to the question, "When will you come back, Lord?" And I told you that I'll give you a short summary of the two before so that you at home can go analyze them on, on your own to check if uh, what I said was true. The first of them is the parable the parable of the, uh, the day and the hour that is unknown. Uh, where the story speaks about uh, how we should be ready for the days to come because they'll be like Noah and uh, you know, the time is unknown. You'll, you'll come, uh, the, the, the time, the, 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 the hour that the Lord will come again is unknown to us, so we should be ready at all times. Then comes the parable of the ten virgins. And this uh, parable speaks about how the Lord could possibly come late. He come later than expected at least. And then we have the third one, the parable of the bags of God. And each have uh, certain ideas borrowed from one another. And the, uh, the summary of the parable of the, of, uh, the bags of God is um, to wait for the coming of Jesus as servants that, some, that we, we've been invested with the wealth of our master and we are, we are in debt to invest and put it to good use. So I've structured my uh, sermon tonight in three parts. 
for it to be easily understood. And in the first part, we'll analyze together the cultural aspect of this parable. What does it mean culturally? To then uh, extract some universally available, uh, valid, some universally valid um, ideas that could be applicable to our lives as well. Jesus will come again, dear loved ones. I want to start off by saying that. So, this parable illustrates the way that a master uh, deals with his, his servants in the context of an imminent journey. There's three servants and they each receive a sum of money, a value, a certain amount of wealth, and each uh, is judged on how they use the wealth. But for us to understand the text properly, we need to understand a few aspects. What, does, uh, what is a bag of gold? What is a bag of gold? Maybe for some of you it's, it's more difficult to understand. We have the tendency to, to associate uh, these gifts with, with uh, talents. In antiquity, uh, a bag of gold was a uh, certain, certain uh, amount of gold, 30 kilograms, 20 kilograms of gold, or 30, 20 kilograms of gold. Now imagine how much these guys had received, how much one bag of, of, of gold really was. You know, we see that this guy gained, got five bags, this guy got three bags, this guy got one, but one bag, don't imagine one bag as pennies, but... Imagine having, it was roughly about 6,000 um, tokens of gold in one bag. Pretty much the, the sum of, of, of uh, a whole life's work. Another idea here is the fact that the person who received these immense values, they are slaves. They're not children, they're not... Uh, uh, hired people, people hired to work for him with a certain contract or whatever. No, they are slaves. So seeing as what what this, this bag of gold represents and who receives the bag of gold, I want to show you guys one more thing. When we think about slavery in Israel, we don't we're not talking about any type of slavery. They weren't just slaves off the coast of Africa that maybe weren't un, were uneducated. In uh, ancient Israel, a man would invest a certain amount of money in a, in a business. And then after losing the, the business, the money, they, he found himself in debt. And there weren't rules to, to help him out or laws. And the man would have to sell himself as a slave to be able to pay back the debt. So you'd have all types of categories of slaves, from the most simple people that were actually enslaved at war or something, or people that were smart and just failed businessmen. And this uh, master gives these slaves uh, each an, an, an X amount of money. The parable continues with the three different ways that the slaves invest the, the, the wealth that they had received seeing as the value and the immense value that they had. We want to take another thing in consideration. Back then, there was no Bitcoin. Back then, there was no easy method to invest in mass. You couldn't invest 100 million in Mercedes Ford or other big brands. Back then, such a big sum as that could not be invested without sacrifices, could not be invested on a laptop somewhere and, and lost or won easily. You, were, you, you had to work daily to efficiently invest uh, that amount of money. How could you invest and earn more money? Through a farm, through you would plant stuff, grow stuff, and buy new seeds and pay workers to harvest and so on. For you to invest such a big sum of money, you couldn't chill at home, relaxing and doing nothing. So the first slave investing the five uh, bags of gold brings another profit of another five bags. And the one of five bags, the one of two bags, also brings profit of another two bags. And the one of one bag buries his his uh, his bag. And now, after a long time, this borrows from the previous parable. In the previous parable, we we said that Christ could come later than expected. So we are expected to wait like people who are. We should wait for Jesus as people are ready for for any x amount of time, or for for the possibility for Christ to come late. And after a long time, the master comes back and the, the first uh, slave with the five bags says, Master, you know, I've gained another five bags. I've doubled your investment. And we almost feel his pride, the pride in the voice of this servant. You know, Master, you gave me five. I, I want five more for you. And the same thing happens with, with the, the guy with two bags. 
And what does his master say? Well done, great job, servant. Faithful servant. Never now, not to think, a master will never say well done to his servant. A master will never praise. You will never find a master that, that praises his, his slaves. No, you're a slave. You're obliged to work for him. I have rights over your life. You have no right anymore. Why should I praise you? Why should I go, go make my bed, go cook my food? But what does the master do? Praises them. Well done. Congratulations, my friend. And he does something more, something fascinating. Firstly, imagine how rich this master was. If, 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 if the master is able to say to his servant, you, know, you were faithful in tiny things. Five bags, little thing. You were faithful with, with few things. You'll be put in charge of many things. How rich was that servant, how was that master that he considers five bags of gold a little thing? And the slave notice he doesn't gain freedom, but he's put to work more. But what is interesting is that the master shares his joy with his with his servants. How many of you that have that are bosses that at the end of the month when you gain X amount of money, share your joy with your your work colleagues? You know, let's all share this X amount. No, they each get however much salary they have and, and they go home. But what does the servant do? Well done, come, come with me, come with my joy. I'll put you in charge of many things, of bigger things. I remind you. These are slaves that have no merit. This, this speaks about God's grace. But what does the third, the third slave do? You know, he tries to excuse himself, saying that you're a, you're a mean man. You, you search for things, you, you search to harvest from places you haven't sown, you haven't worked. And that lazy servant tries to find excuses by trying to, to, to say that the master's the one at fault, that he's the one who's mean and bad. And he gives back to the master the one bag that he had received. So what exactly happens in this parable? You know, we've summarized it. But now I want to highlight a few things, show you a few realities that are applicable to us as well. Because this parable is not a simple parable that we should read as a story and it sounds amazing and interesting and we keep going. This parable is written for us with a well-established purpose and it's applicable for us and we are in the same category. The first reality, universal reality, is the universal the, the 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 how universal it is to, to the the fact that everyone receives an amount every slave receives an x amount of of bags of of money of wealth this means that each of us one two five we don't know how many there is no man here that has not received from god at least one bag of gold of wealth you would never be able to say god i have nothing no, God in His mercy gives, and in His in His grace and His wisdom, maybe gives us one, five, three, maybe more bags. Secondly, God does this despite your status as a slave. God does this and entrusts you, entrusts you to invest your His wealth in you, even though you're a slave. This is what the master did to his slaves. Even though they were slaves with no right to say anything, no right to their own life, the master has faith in them and gives them his wealth. So God does this despite our status as a slave. And again, we, have the, we, we put up this question. Why should we boast about anything? Why should we be prideful for things that we have accomplished? Everything that you have, any opportunity, every position that you have in society does not come because of your merits, but it's only the grace of God who gives from, who gives from His abundance of blessings to you. Don't believe that you manage to do anything in your own accord, your own strength, but it's only the grace of the Master that has put you where you are today. Three, God establishes based on everyone in conformity with His will and with our ability how many bags of gold each of us receives. It's, it's all up to God how many bags of gold you have. Observe what the Master does. He gives to each according to their own power. The Master does a clear analysis and takes everyone, looks at them and says, you know, you can do this much, I'll give you five bags. You can do more, I'll give you more. The, it's the duty of the Master to give from his wealth and his responsibilities, not the, 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 the right of the slave to say, God, I want this much. God, I want that and that. No, it's not, it's not your choice. You're a slave. The master decides to each slave how much they, they, they will do, how much they will receive. 
Four. And don't forget, not everyone has the same talent, the same ability. No one's. No, we're not all supposed to be speakers. We all have our, our, the wealth that we have. Already, we're not going to be farmers of the wealth now, are we? Now, no matter how many bags you received, one, five, two, whatever, it's an immense amount of wealth, a huge amount of wealth that you can't run away from, even if it's one bag. How, do you, how much value do you put on it? How do you see things? Five, you have a duty to work expecting for Christ, uh, for the Master's comeback. It's not a work for one day. We don't come to, to church one day to help out and then, you know, we've invested the God's wealth. No. Oh, the Master, God can come back after your life ends. You can die and wake up in heaven and then you'll be judged for how you've invested your wealth. The slaves didn't have time to, to ponder and to think about stuff. They didn't have time to, to, to sit around. They were obliged and forced to invest continuously with the wealth that they had been given. Six, the ultimate goal is not uh, investing in self-interest, but in the interests of the master. This is what qualifies a slave as one who is faithful. You know, all three slaves received. One invests in, two invest in, in and, and, and gain more. And one, one slave searches for his own interests. He wants to save his own skin. He was afraid of losing stuff, uh, losing the wealth and, and uh, angering his master even more. We all want to be sons of God now, don't we? But as soon as we call ourselves slaves, everything ends. Me a slave? No, come on, I'm not a slave. I don't see myself as that. The duty of every man is to invest into the expansion of the kingdom of God and not in their own self-interest, despite us being slaves or children of God or whatever we are. There are some people that believe that it costs too much to invest in, in what the Master wants. It costs too much. I don't have enough time. I don't have. But for you, for your Master to buy you, to make you his slave. It cost, him, it, it cost him everything. It cost him his life. You'll never be able to say, I can't because it's too much. It, he died on a cross for you to make you his son, his, to, to enslave you. Next, they received their, 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 the, the two slaves that doubled, that doubled their, their bags. As soon as they received it, they started putting it to work. God doesn't need for people that are ready to work for him 5, 10, 15 years from now. God wants people that as soon as they change, as soon as He worked in their lives, he, they're ready and, and ready to, act, to, to, to be active and to work for Him. Eight, the reality of Christ's second coming. The reality of the second coming of Christ that comes uh, alongside Judgment Day. The Master comes back eventually. Even in the, in the parable, after a long time, we don't know how many years had passed, but the Master had come back. And what does the Master do? He, he puts questions, you know, he starts asking him, what have you done with, with, what have you done with my money, my wealth? There is no slave that wasn't asked. Every slave, each and every one of us will be asked to, do, to, to answer for how we, how we administrated the, the wealth that God has put in us. Nine, and I want you guys to remember this. The master puts value not over how much wealth they managed to win back, but their devotement and, and faithfulness. Listen to the answer that he gives to, to the first and the second. You know, one of the first one had five extra bags of gold. The second one only had two extra bags. But read what the master says in text. To both of them, they see the master says the same thing. Well done, good and faithful servant. Well, come on, God, I, I, I earned five extra bags for you and he had two. Do we get the same reward? What do you mean? No, the master says to both of them, well done, good and faithful servants. God evaluates and will, will put value over not how much wealth we manage to make at the end of the day, or high, how high up you manage to climb the ranks, but how much you invested and your, your, how much you devoted yourself. Maybe someone has a single, a single gift to carry chairs, I don't know. God will ask you that day, your gift, the one gift that you had, what did you do with it? Not how many you had. Maybe you'll have five gifts and not do anything with them. Maybe you will, you will waste the talents that God has given you, the wealth that God has put in you. It matters how you administrate it. Ten, God gives grace in his com when He comes again. The slaves, despite being slaves, they receive God's blessing. Don't forget, even for this we work. 
we work so that one day we can receive God's blessing to, to rejoice in his in his blessing 11 and I think that we don't like the master is severe and treats the, the, the unfaithful servant severely and harshly and I know we'd like to only hear about God's grace and mercy I'm convinced of this I like it too but what does the master do to the unfaithful servant the unfaithful servant is punished is punished because yes God loves and is merciful but God is also righteous and just and God one day will, will call you to answer will call you to answer on judgment day what have you done and if you haven't done if you've done nothing you're an unfaithful servant it's a very serious business we cannot play with these things God invested in us and we cannot say that we've received nothing but everything that we've received that on that judgment day whether he will either be blessed and, and we'll enter heaven for it or we'll be sent to hell the slave that hasn't done anything has been kicked out of his grace and mercy. It doesn't matter that the slave didn't the slave didn't lose the money. The slave didn't waste the money, lose the money, gambled it away. He didn't do anything. He didn't lose it. But he also didn't do anything. God judges the fact that he didn't invest and he didn't work on, 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 on the wealth that he had given, that he had received. God judges him for being lazy. The sin of the lazy servant wasn't that he lost the money. But the fact that he didn't work it with what he was supposed to. That's why we should pay very close attention to what it is that we have received and how we administrate it because God will ask us one day, what have we done? Now looking back, looking behind us, retrospectively, from six months since the beginning of the year, can you count on your fingers the amount of things that you've done for God? And to say, I've done this, I can praise myself, Master. If today you are to come, I can boast before you that I've done this, this and this for you. That I've done these five things and I've invested in this way and that way. What category are we in? Are in the people that have done nothing and will be embarrassed on that day that he comes before the Lord? It will cost us everything. What have you done? Practically. Practically. In theory, we all know, yes, we should do this. But practically, what have we done? How much have we invested? This is all that matters. Everything else is just, is just opinions and arguments. I, for, I had preached this to myself first and foremost because I realized that I don't invest as much as I should. So, these are the realities of the parable. These are the realities that are applicable to us as well. And now I'd like us to, to look at the principles, how Jesus teaches us to be, how should we, exp how should we wait for His second coming. How does, De how does Jesus, through this parable, Jesus teaches us how to be ready? The first principle, the general one, the general one that I've, I've, I've spoken before. Expect Christ's coming as slaves who have been given wealth from the Master with the goal to invest it. When you analyze yourself, as we said, the parable of the, of the bags of gold doesn't tell us what, what the bags were for. We can only speculate and it's not good. But I am completely convinced that each of you has at least one bag. And you are in debt, dear loved one, to find out what it is. It may be money, as, as, as the, the servants had received. But it, 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 it could be a talent. It could be a skill. Expect Christ's coming as a man who will, be, who will have to give answers to the Lord for how you've used his wealth, his, the talents that he had given you, how you put to use the skills, the talents that he has, he, has, he has given you. It's a responsibility that you have and you must carry. Secondly, analyze in your life your abilities. The possibilities that you have, the opportunities that you have. God rests you in a certain place with a special purpose, with a goal. You going to work and you have people under you and people under you have never heard from your mouth that Christ is Lord and you work with them for two, three, five years. What are you investing in? What are you doing? If the people that you work with day, day in, day out don't know from you that you're a Christian and that you're following Jesus, what have you invested in? What seeds have you planted? Thirdly, the prophet, the prophet is the Lord's, is the Master's, not ours. That's why we need to take care of what we do, what we invest in. How many times do we invest in, in trash and general waste that one day will all burn one day? How many, things, how many times do we invest in, in earthly things, in materialistic things? You know, it's not bad to have a good car, a nice house, a nice whatever, but it must not take priority in our life. It must be a, a, a secondary thing. We should prioritize God and God's uh, interests. Four, 
Don't be passive. You're not allowed to be passive. You cannot be a pacifist. You can't be passive about things. To live a life that's passive, living in an idea that one day when I was young, I've done this for I've done this for the Lord. But it's useless. God calls you every day to come before Him and to be that slave to do, that, that does something. You cannot be passive about this. Analyze your own life. How do you work for the Lord? Five. Run. Run from uh, the religion that uh, only gives you a set of rules to not do anything bad. That The third servant was afraid of not doing anything wrong. He wasn't afraid that he wasn't doing anything good either. He was afraid of not doing anything bad. Run from the religion that's just a set of rules. Don't do this, don't do that. Flee from that place. True religion is to do good, not to just avoid bad. It's not enough just for us to live avoiding evil, avoiding sin. God calls us to be strong and to stand against evil, but to stick to ourselves, to stick and to do good to others. To be glued to good deeds. Second, uh, next step. Next, sorry, next point. Live under God's light. We'll all face a day when we'll be judged. Some as Christians, some as enlightened by God and have done nothing. But we'll all stand before judgment day. Live in, in, in His light. I ask you one thing. If you knew that Christ was to come two weeks from now, what would you change in your life? How would you, le how would you lead the next two weeks differently? Tell me. What would you change? What would I change? If you knew that, God, that Christ was to come two weeks from now, what would you change? Would you stop working? You wouldn't be worried about playing football anymore. Not that it would be bad to play football, but what would you do? You would change things, wouldn't you? And now I ask you another thing. How do you know when the master's coming? Can he not come today? Can he not come tomorrow? You don't know. I don't know. The slaves didn't know. Jesus tells us, be ready. Be ready at all times. Seven. Don't compare yourself to others. Don't compare yourself to anyone else. The slaves each individually received a certain amount of wealth, of talents, of whatever the master gave to them. And they were in debt to work with what they, what they had. Not with what the, the other had. Many times we have this problem, we compare ourselves to others. He does this, I can't. He works like this, he does that. that, that. Don't compare yourself to others. The master would not ask you what the other was able to do. How many times do we look over the fence to our neighbor? You know, he received five bags and I received one. God, why? Why? Well, it's not your duty. It's not the duty of the servant to put questions. Don't compare yourself to others. God has created you for a goal and he invests in you as a hand or you know, in the body of Christ, God has put you and has blessed you to be a hand or a mouth or an eye or an ear. We're so worried about people that are five different body parts at once. Others invest in their own way. No, well, God will judge you personally. You just He won't judge you collectively because you've done this and others have done less. He will judge you on an individual basis. Eight, God will appreciate the effort, the sacrifice that you put in. Maybe you're not good at preaching or singing. This isn't everything you can do at church. I lived many times with this impression that work is only in, the, in, the, in, the, in between the four walls of church. If you don't sing, you don't preach, you're not working for the Lord. Working for the Lord, expanding the kingdom doesn't limit itself only to this. There's a whole variety of different works you can do. Don't limit yourself, don't compare yourself to others and don't limit yourself to only a few things. God appreciates the effort and your sacrifice. The effort you put in it. If it doesn't cost you anything, it doesn't. it's not worth anything. It doesn't cost you anything, it's not worth anything. We'd love so much to just relax in bed, to say a few words and at the end to receive the reward. To get a pat on the shoulder. No, if it doesn't cost you anything, there's no sacrifice, then it's not worth anything. Nine. Don't forget, you can be kicked out. Don't forget, you can be kicked out. The proof that... Proof that you are here today means that you're doing something. Well, hopefully you're doing something. The good tree bears good fruits. And the bad tree bears bad fruits. And the bad tree gets cut down. That's what the Bible says. If you don't do, if you don't bear good fruits, then you're not, you're not a good servant. Full stop. 
You will know them after their presence? No. After their words? No. We can lie to one another and put different masks on and say that we're holy people and they were good servants. I can stand before you and pose as a holy person. And in reality, who knows what's hi what, I hi what I'm hiding in my life or you're hiding in your lives. Proof that we are faithful servants is that we, are in we invest. Otherwise, it's all equal to nothing. What fruits do you bear? Are there fruit? Are, do you bear any fruits to bear proof that you are a good servant? What do you do for your master? You know, you can't hide. You found out that you can't say that you have nothing because you have at least one bag. And you can't go in a corner to say that others will work, I'm not going to work. You found that out today. You found out that the master is righteous and that on that faithful day, he will judge you. You found out that the, the masters are so harsh and, will, and just. He will punish those who have done nothing. And that day isn't far off. And now you and me, what do we do? What are we doing? What are we investing in? You know what I ask myself many times, you know, why do we need to pull our sleeves? You know, come on, come help out, man. Come on. Come, you as well, man. Come. Look, there's, there's space for you to come and join us to work as well. Why should my brother pull me and ask me to help out? Why, why does it not come from ourselves? Why do we love to sit on our, on our chairs so much and not do anything? Why do we need to be pushed from the back? Come on, come help, come work, come. It's hard that many times, you know, you need to pull people to come to church as well. Never mind working for the, for, for the Lord, working at church. It's a reality. I don't want to be harsh or to put guilt on people. But it hurts. It hurts to see this. For me and for you, it hurts that God one day will judge the way that we live and will ask us. And now I'm in debt and I love... I love being able to tell you this that one day God individually would ask you what did you do and on that day there won't be excuse God yeah, I was busy I, was, I had to do this I had other plans no I'll tell you one more thing they loved us our priorities matter in a hundred years from now no one will ask you what car you had what house you built what clothes you wore no one will, no one will ask you God doesn't care about this God will ask you what have you done what have you worked in, in for, for, for me? What have you, how have you worked for my kingdom? It's very simple. We deceive ourselves thinking that we're good, we're okay. But in the end, only one thing matters. What, have you, what fruits have you bared? The slaves that receive the blessing from the masters are only the ones that have invested their wealth. I wouldn't like, oh, I'd hate to see that day for us to leave as, as that last servant. I'd hate that day for, to hear Jesus say, Flee from me for I never knew you. But it's possible, it's a possibility. And the Bible says that it will happen. And if this doesn't frustrate you, it's problematic. If we don't wake up thinking about this, that the master one day could tell us, I don't know you. We're so far away. We're so far away from the truth. And I'd like to end tonight by addressing you the following question, affirmation. The parable doesn't tell us what the bags represent. They, I mean, we can interpret that they're bags of gold, and I'd speculate this, but I'll tell you one thing that I'm sure of, that the best investment in... in the best, in, the best possible investment is for you to bring people before the cross. The best investment you can make is to bring new disciples to Christ. Maybe you didn't have a million people like Billy Graham or I don't know, you hundreds of people. But for you to be able to tell the master one day, these six people, I don't have others, I haven't managed to do anything else, but these six people that you have entrusted me, I cried for them, I prayed for them, I preached the gospel to them, I, I fasted for them, they're mine, master, for you to be able to, to boast yourself, to praise yourself. God, you have given me five, I, I bring you five. The most important investment in the house of the Lord is to win souls for Him. The most important. What more can be more valuable? You can give bread to a person and feed him and that person can end up in hell. But if you give them the bread of life from his, from his heart, and endless, infinite supplies of water will, 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 will flood. The best investment that you can make in the house of the Lord is to make other slaves for the master to have more slaves. After the resurrection, Jesus sends his disciples everywhere, in every corner of the world. And he sends us today as well. Don't stop, don't sit, go. Go out, go preach the gospel. Preach the, preach the gospel, preach the cross. And I'll ask you, are you, from, are you part of the disciples that are embarrassed of, of, of Christ?
When you're in a more difficult circumstance, you hide. Maybe you, you won't even say that you're Christian. You would rather say that you're sinful, you're, you're from the world. Are you from those people? Are you people that hide that, that you're slaves of Christ? A city that's on the, on, on up higher in the mountains and fortified and, and with flags raised is seen by everyone. Do you have the flag raised up that you are a son of God? That Christ is your master? But more than just appearances from your words, from your character, from your way of being, how many of you know that you're Christian? How many of you can see that you're followers of Christ? How many people have you preached to? How, how many people have you preached to? You don't need to be in the next Billy Graham or the greatest evangelist ever, but you need to be a witness of Christ. And just tell them that Christ died on the cross because the gospel alone is enough power to save people. You just need to be that slave that takes God's wealth. The greatest wealth that the master has is his cross and his word. Take it and invest it. Plant it into other people's hearts. Share it with others. The best investment is people, not things. Many times we invest in things and not people, but that's not a good plan. The master calls us to invest in people. We need to be people that invest in others because we will be called to answer one day. And maybe one day, we will hear from the mouth of us of our masters that he never knew us. But we might also hear, well done, you faithful servant. Let's all stand up. If till now you haven't invested, you haven't worked for the Lord, tell the Lord, Lord, I want you to change my heart. I want you to open my eyes, change my perspective, change my priorities. I want to give up on the trash of my life, on my worldly priorities. And I want to invest in the things that truly matter in you, in your kingdom, in your glory, so that one day we can all hear, we can all hear the words, well done, you faithful servant. Enter, enter my, my, my joy, enter heaven. These are the most beautiful words. How beautiful would these words sound when, they, when, they're, when, they're spoken on, when they're spoken to you? Well done. Great job. And we will say as people in Matthew 25, God, when did we see you do all these things? And any times you do these things to the most insignificant of people, you do them to Christ. Don't forget their loved ones. That's all. And to prayer. Amen.